His Excellency, the Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany, His Lordship uh, Chief Justice Atananella, distinguished guests, the technological experts here, lawyers, advocates, Assalamu alaikum. Recently, in a dissent that came out in Ghazi Faiz Isa's case, um, uh, in an application that he had given to the court that there should be live streaming of his proceedings, three judges dissented and allowed the application. But there should be live streaming. And I just quote from that order. Whether the time has come to open our courtroom and allow public access to justice, judicial proceedings through live audio video streaming. Sunshine is said to be the best disinfectant. We need to ask ourselves whether the traditional closed architecture of our courtroom needs to be redesigned. To allow sunshine of public access through live audio video streaming. Should we embrace technology and align ourselves with the modern judiciaries of the world by giving online access to the public to our court proceedings? And do we wish to make our justice system more transparent by holding judicial proceedings in public gaze? These were the questions posed and we allowed the application, I being one of the judges who allowed the application. While we were still mulling over the idea of live streaming, I must announce that nobody else but Justice Atar Manila, the Chief Justice of Islamabad High Court, went ahead and implemented the whole thing. And now the first court in the country with live streaming is the Islamabad High Court. And I think that is our big club. So as you know, nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And to me, technology and law the time has come, you see. We cannot possibly think of proceeding further with our judicial proceedings or running the courthouse without technology. So I'm going to be sharing some ideas, even though I've looked at some of the products here, which is absolutely encouraging. I'm, I'm so happy, it's so refreshing, so re-energizing actually to be here and to see all these young people coming up with these applications using technology. We didn't have all this in our time, but it's absolutely brilliant. These platforms, several of them, several of them have been mentioned, but I want to also point out few others which are there and then comment about how, how we need to proceed further. I'm sorry about this um, incapacity of mine to go through my notes because of the lack of the rostrum here, but let me just, um, some of the products were already discussed here, you saw them. And at the same time, there are others which I wanted to highlight and I'm very happy that this is happening. For example, we have the quoting the law also, in addition to the, the ones that uh, were discussed and were displayed today. Two of them, I think, are very, are very happy to note that they really help out the court proceedings. The bench book was very important and it helps the court proceedings and the law practice was also very helpful. And I'll be, you know, trying to reach out. I've already reached out to the bench book people that are working with our research center. But I'll be very happy if the law practice people could also come visit me sometimes. I think we can work on something as far as the Judicial Academy and the training program is concerned. The other ones are the quoting the law, which, which, which does a lot of good work. Kanundan, Insaf Camp, we have motosip.pk, we have the Keel Online, which you've already heard about. There is gathersense.com, there is lawyerherb.pk, and there is parksign.pk. I won't get into what they do, but in essence, these apps are all providing a lot of awareness, telling, making people understand their rights, making people understand that they could agitate these rights in a court of law. So in essence, I think that these apps are actually appetizers, you see, they're, they're trying to tell people what the rights are and perhaps they're going to help bring these people to court and there's going to be an increase in litigation to my mind because anybody who understands their rights will agitate those rights and there will be a combative kind of a situation where they will try to come to court. So these apps at this stage, to my mind, are appetizers which are bringing a lot more people onto the courthouse. My concern today is to understand how to sort out the courthouse problem, you see. If everybody gets into the courthouse, how do we regulate, 
how do we bring technology to solve our courthouse? And what is our courthouse? And I refer to courthouse as judiciary, which talks about, which is the district court, which is civil court, which is the high court, which is also the supreme court. But as a generic term, I use the term uh, the courthouse. So what does the courthouse actually look like at the moment? See? Now, courthouse has about 2.2 million cases in Pakistan, all these courts put together. And if we have two litigants per case, we're talking about 5 million average litigants who are coming to these courts. We have about 5,000 judges in the country, starting from Supreme Court down to the trial courts. We have about 200,000 lawyers in the country and say about 200,000 paralegal staff that works with them. Then we have the statutory corporations, we have the government, we have the departments, and the in-house lawyers representing them, then the court staff itself. So we're looking at a minimum of about 10 million people accessing the courthouse, and 2.2 million cases that need to be handled and uh, taken care of. That's the level, that's the level of the problem, that is what the courthouse is all about. I do not see any app solving the problems of the courthouse, which is the actual main course. And I'll be very happy, and I try to do this in Karachi also, I'll be very happy if all the technological experts sitting here, the young ones, would come reach out to us and give us solutions. And how do we really work out a solution for the courthouse, which would actually affect and change the life of an ordinary person in Pakistan? Well, I have some suggestions which I'll be sharing with you in just a while. But you see, we judges are not technical experts. We just think about these ideas, maybe some deep thinking on part of some of the judges, but it, the answers must actually come from the floor. So it's, you're most welcome. You can reach out to me anytime you want if you have ideas on how do we look at these problems and how do we sort out these 2.2 million cases that we have. I will, however, share some of my ideas with you in just a minute. I want to also, statistics are important in 2010, we had about a pendency of 1.5 million cases in the country. In 2021, we have 2.2 million cases. This is an increase. The institution of cases in the country in the year 2010 were 2.6 million. And the institution now is 38.5 million cases. So it is pretty worrying. And unless we have a mechanism of dealing with all these cases, we are heading towards a problem. To me, the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge the courthouse has today is delay, delay, and delay. Nothing else. We are just not handling our trials. The trials, it takes years. I mean, it's, a, it's now a cliche. I mean, generations pass in deciding cases. So delay, to my mind, is the biggest challenge that we need to address. And to all the techies sitting here, I'm saying, if you have to focus on something, you have to talk about delay reduction. You have to see how do we cut down this delay because it actually devastates the families, it devastates litigants, it devastates the economy if cases are delayed. And that's how the problem is, which subsists right now. What are the reasons for this, to my mind? And I, I don't speak here for the Supreme Court, but I speak here as a, a judge who's been thinking about these issues. So don't sort of ascribe it to the institution. It's just a personal thought that I'm sharing. So what are the reasons for this delay as I see it? I see no case management techniques. I say poor case management, maybe, but no case management maybe. I talk about no technology there to monitor what's really happening. How do we look after this 2.2 million cases? Is there any technology at work? Is there a science behind it? Is there a strategy? Are we monitoring all this? No, perhaps. Adjournments, roll of the bar comes up, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Strikes. Every day, once in a while, in Punjab especially, you have strikes. You see the lawyers go on strikes. So, okay, no work today. Training of judges is also important, which takes place, but not as effective as required. Unstructured load of work. We have all sorts of cases, all sorts of subjects, not organized. How are they being fixed? So the case management comes up once, up, uh, once again. And lack of communication between the three tiers of judiciary. I mean, we're not really talking to the district judiciary. We're not really talking to the high court that much. It's not, I mean, I don't know of an occasion when, when this institution sat down together and talked, the three tiers talked about their problems. I don't know if the session judge knows 
I know what the session judge's problems are. Has the session judge ever walked into my room and told me what his problems are? No, unless I take interest. The institution isn't talking to each other. There's lack of communication. In an institution which has lack of communication, things don't get sorted. So what we did at that time in early 90s, we thought, let's automate our systems. So automation was the answer that we thought of. We provided computers to type orders, so you get all these typed computerized orders. We came up with a website and, and, and which had orders, some of the main judgments. We came up with a website that also had a cause list and helped a lot of people, <coughs> excuse me, helped a lot of people find out what their cases were that were fixed. We came up with an SMS service for the lawyers to find out what cases are fixed and when they are fixed just to give them more access. Uh, we, we came up with a database also to find out how many family cases we have and how many murder trials are, we have and stuff like that. We also came up with mobile apps, which I'm sure most of the lawyers are familiar. Supreme Court has it, Super high courts have it. And then we came up with a, the CNIC as a number identification for the lawyers so that you can easily identify who the lawyer is. And we tried to capture as much data as when the cases were fine. So this is what automation was all about at that time. We thought this would make a difference and everything will change and the courts will, will, will get rid of all these cases and things would become very efficient, but nothing really happened because to my mind, behind this computer facade was a manual stuff at work. We were manually doing everything. When we were talking about case management, which the computer was showing, there was a manual uh, uh, stuff going on. I mean, there were, there, were, there were judicial branch officers who were actually putting those cases for fixation manually, however they're being displayed as a, a part of the computerized system. There was no intelligence based system installed in the Thai court or the Supreme Court which would, which would rely on some sort of uh, algorithm or which could rely on some sort of intelligence that the computer would offer. No, there was no such thing. So largely, the entire automation system to my mind was manual in nature. And this manual uh, exercise was done by nobody else but some officer sitting in the judicial branch who could play, well, have it with the system if, if, if he wanted. Because what cases to fix, what cases to fix where, what cases not to fix. So uh, the automation exercise to my mind did not work that way. And uh, we, we still have that automation and we think that uh, with the computers in place, maybe there's some advantages, of course, things improved in one side, in one way or the other, but not the way we wanted it to change things. See, so automation did not work. The auto automation did not populate the cases according to the intelligence that I'm talking about. I mean, what cases to go before what bench? What category of cases to be fixed? Cases which are old should have been fixed. Cases which are of prisoners who are sulking behind bars should have been fixed earlier. Cases relating to women, cases relating to children, cases relating to people with old age. Was there a system that recognized and found those cases and got them fixed before the court? I doubt it. There were no internal flags being put up that this case is not, this has not been decided for the last six months or eight months or a year. There were no flags. The system doesn't really say, God, I mean, this case is pending for a year. We better do something about it. There is no urgency that is created in the system because the system is not based on any smart intelligence. It is manually based and we label it as automation and there is a computer lying there doing whatever we tell the computer to do. So the, the system also failed to tell what were the conflicting judgments of the Supreme Court or the High Court which is playing havoc in the lower courts because the civil judges or the district judges don't know what judgment to follow. There was no issue, nobody was really concerned what was happening. So, in the absence of all this, at the end of the day, automation lacked intelligence to my mind. And it was purely manual. So, I think now the, 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 what, what automation lacked was the sense of urgency, you see, which is very important, which is attached to a case relating to human rights maybe, relating to the economy, relating to the country as, as a whole. So some individual sitting in the judicial branch is deciding how the justice sector ought to be working, how the courthouse is to work. 
which I think is perhaps very sad and not, uh, not the way we're going to proceed further in the future. So what I propose today is that we need to move from automation to transformation. And it is the transformation that might change things, I hope. And transformation is actually retooling, refiguring the whole way, the way we work. We have to do some major changes in the way we work. It's not just by putting a computer there or an app here or an app there. There has to be a restructuring of the way we look at justice sector if we want to really handle our courthouse, which is now uh, which has 2.2 million cases, and you've seen the institution to be 38.5 million cases. So this upgrading or transformation would attend to one challenge, of course, and the challenge remains the same, and that is delay, delay, delay. Unless and until these trials are done on time, because you get a bail in Pakistan, the trial is over. You get a stay order in Pakistan, the suit is over. That's not how it is in the world. And we need to understand that. The culture of stays and injunctions have to go. The culture of getting a bail and just going and sleeping is, has to go. Trials have to be conducted. Trials have to be completed. Only then would the accountability really set in and we'll be able to achieve justice as, as, we, as, as justice should be. You see, And that's what our role is. So one legal reform that I will just be proposing how, what, what ideas I have on transformation, but that would achieve one end, to reduce the trial or reduce the shelf life of the case to one year. You come to the justice sector, civil court, and you get done with the Supreme Court in a year. You're out of our system. Do whatever you want to do. You've come to the justice sector, you be done with you in one year, we'll decide whatever all the forums, ideally. And we could, I mean, we could reduce it to six months, maybe, ideally, but now let's, let's keep it to one year. If you start deciding cases, starting from the civil court up to the Supreme Court in one year, the country is going to be revolutionized, I assure you. Everything is going to change because accountability sets in so fast that, you know, you'll see the changes. You see. That is not happening. If a trial is not taking place for 20 years, or if somebody sort of starts off with the civil court and ends with the third generation ends up with the Supreme Court, you know, justice delayed, as they say, is justice denied, and it's practically that. So the one objective, as I said, is to attend to delay, and the other objective is to ensure that we can complete this trial, this entire process from the trial court to the Supreme Court in one year. And I'm talking about all the tiers. I'm talking about civil court, high court, Supreme Court, one year, total period, and you get done with this. So how do we go about all this, and how will this just happen? Automation hasn't really worked, as I pointed out earlier. So now, these are some of my ideas that I want to share. What do we do for transformation? It's high time that we redefine the concept of access to justice. Access to justice, to my mind, has been very limited so far. Being able to approach the court is access to justice. No. I think access to justice now needs to mean that not only do you approach the court, but you get the final decision. The conclusion of the whole case is really access to justice. So when you talk about right to life and right to dignity under the Constitution leading to access to justice, I think we need to redefine it. Access to justice is when I get the final decision from the court. I am not interested in a bail order. I am not interested in a stay order. I want the whole thing concluded. That would bring the access to justice full circle, and that, to my mind, would be then the access to justice that a person talks about. And if we want to say that right to life under the Constitution or right to dignity being our fundamental rights under the Constitution have any weight or value, then access to justice should mean the conclusion of the whole matter so that you're done with the justice sector. That is access to justice. The second thing which is of some importance is that you don't come straight running to the court. I think we need to now start building those filters. We can't, every, any, there's any matter, you just come rushing to the high court or come rushing to the court. No. We need to compulsorily introduce mediation and arbitration in the system. It has to be embedded in the system. There has to be an, uh, 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 you, you come to the court via the ADR. 
you have to go to the ADR, which is alternate dispute resolution, alternative dispute resolution, which has mediation, and if mediation doesn't work, which is voluntary, you get to arbitration. If arbitration doesn't work, then you come to the court. That is important. It happens all over the world. We have some legislation which is on the shelf talking about mandatory uh, mediation in, in some of the provinces, which needs to see the light soon. And our arbitration law, I mean, that's a subject we can discuss some other time, our local arbitration law has to change because it has too much intervention of the court. That requires another debate altogether. But an ADR center is essential or ADR process is essential. Nobody rushes to the court immediately. Everybody here has, uh, there's no such concept. And, and, and there are people sitting here representing regulators and corporations. And I think by law, there has to be a mechanism that if there's any grievance within the institution, let it. I mean, there are some examples also, but there has to be a mandatory mediation process within these statutes. For example, ACCP here or NADRA or OGRA or whatever. There must be a dispute settlement within first before you come to the court. That would also uh, reduce litigation and maybe sort out a number of matters right there. And they would probably understand the matter much more than the, by the time the matter gets to the high court because a lot more legalese that comes into it. The matters resolved at the locale are far better and, and, and one should do that. Then we need to also see if we can open up a, a, a portal. Uh, every time you file, and this is where technology comes in, every time a case is filed, a portal or an e-filing system is, you know, generated. Everybody, it's all e-filing, it's all electronic. Anybody who has to file a reply, files the reply in that account number. So there is no such thing that I copy not get a copy, I didn't get a answer, I didn't get a answer. Everything goes into the electronic system and they, they get uploaded. If anybody wants an adjournment, that adjournment goes into the system, comes to the court through electronic system and must be supported by a certificate from the hospital. Adjournments have to be seriously addressed. And unless there is an adjournment which is supported by a certificate of the doctor directly uploaded by the hospital for that case, for the judge to see the next day, there is no adjournment. So only then, and there has to be also a system which is very important, that the, 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 there has to be a security, uh, a, a litigant while he files a case must submit a security also. That in case he doesn't show up, he runs away after getting a stay order, some sort of a security is forfeited. So the whole system is electronic. It gives all these, there's inbuilt systems, there are inbuilt costs that are imposed, there's inbuilt system of adjournment, and everything is electronic. Everything is coming up before the court so that there is no running around. You see, you can't just get out of this. So technology has to be, we have to curate something around this that the whole case moves through electronic system. And in that system, everything is filed, adjournments are filed, costs are coming in, in case nobody shows up, how the ex parte system moves, everything is electronic. We need to, the next thing which is important, which is connected, is to redefine the concept of hearing. I think gone are the days that we have a synchronized physical presence of hearing. The world has changed. And if you read Professor Suskin, who writes about online courts and the future of the, of the courts and justice system, we are now talking about hearings which are not synchronized. Synchronized hearing means that both the lawyers are there at the same time, all the parties are there at the same time, that is not going to happen. And as you see every day, the major cause of adjournment is that a lawyer is not shown, showing up or one of the parties is missing and we say, okay, let's wait for a while and then if he doesn't show up, we say, okay, let's adjourn the case. And that we should not be dependent on the physical presence of the parties anymore. Thanks to video linking, which is doing a fantastic job at the Supreme Court as well as some of the high courts. So video linking facility is available. So if we were to redefine the word hearing, which would mean that yes, it could be asynchronized also, in the sense that it need not have everybody there at that very moment. 
So whoever is there is being heard and who is not there can send in their submissions later. We don't need to see the lawyer. The pleadings are there. Skeleton arguments are there. The judge can very well decide the case by looking at the pleadings, by looking at the skeletal argument, and that's good enough. And if the lawyer wants to be heard in person, he must make a special request uh, uh, to the court with a security there also that I want to, sir, appear personally and I, or I want to have uh, be heard directly. In that case, if he doesn't show up, he can send an audio clip, he can send a video clip to the court. And while I've heard the case today, I've heard the other lawyers, I've heard everything, I've gone to my chambers and I have this electronic file. I open the electronic file and by in the evening or by the next day, I receive the audio or video recording of the other lawyer also. So I get to hear him and I say, okay, this is the skeleton argument, this is what he had to say, I've decided the case now. I think we'll have to move to that way of hearing. It, we, we have to get on to bringing in technology into hearing and not rely on everybody's physical presence every day in the court. Court is not a place, it's a service. And the service has to be rendered by people, you know, putting in their inputs. And the inputs can keep coming. And, and the, the techie sitting here could evolve something to this effect. You see, we do not have to see everybody's face to decide a matter. The pleadings are there, skeleton arguments are there. I can read and decide the matter. I don't need to see the lawyer. And if the lawyer insists that he wants to argue, let him send a video clip and I'll just look at that video clip later on when I'm uh, deciding the case or thinking about the case or writing the judgment, whatever. So we need to redefine the way we hear cases. Then we need to come up with a very serious data room. We do not have data center. Data is our biggest problem right now. The credibility of that data is missing. We do not have data country-wise. While sitting at the Supreme Court, I do not have access to tell what is happening in a particular district in Gujranwala, for example. What kinds of cases are being uh, 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 handled there? We do not have a live monitoring data room we'll have to create a data room which supervises our performance every day. If I cannot tell, for example, if I'm a Chief Justice of the High Court and I can't tell what my district judges are doing, I, I have no clue. I have no clue how, I'll get a figure, which is a dead letter, which says a particular district has decided 100 cases. Big deal. I have no idea how many cases did not proceed. I do not know how many cases injunction was granted are pending for a long time. I do not know through that information that how many cases are pending for how long. So unless we have a specialized data room which supervises each and every case, there has to be a big team, a set of auditors maybe, who sit down and understand what is happening. Why isn't this case moving? Why this particular case has been pending for the last six months? Why? and then something, some action has to be done. No such thing is available. We actually have no clue how, which case is pending where and why is it pending and why is it being delayed. So there has to be a far more proactive approach through technology in understanding what's happening. Flags need to come up. Flags need to come up through the minute I open my laptop and I see if I'm looking at a district, flags should come up. This case hasn't been decided for six months and it must sort of bleep or something. It must tell me that this is a red case or whatever. So I, I can take action and some that those cases could be decided. So unless we proactively start monitoring cases, and judiciary alone could do it, nobody else could do it. You can only do it through technology. Technology, keep, there has to be a data room or a situation room that the Supreme Court or the High Court has to create with a specialized team sitting there reporting to the Chief Justice every evening, sir, these six cases, there is a stay order which is going on for the six, for last six months. No way, cannot happen. You need to build timelines, and if timelines are crossed, penalties must take place. So that kind of a proactive, vigilant approach is required if you really want to bring down the caseload and the dependency in this country. Otherwise, it's all just going to go on the way it's going on. Now, the smart case management system is important. The computer system must have artificial intelligence. It must be able to tell which cases should be fixed for hearing. I mean, which cases? Uh, suppose at the Supreme Court we have 50,000 cases as mentioned earlier. What are the cases that should be fixed before me tomorrow? I have no clue. 
somebody fixes some cases and I go hear them. Why? Which cases need to come up first? Considering their age, perhaps, as common sense would say, or cases of prisoners who are sulking behind uh, prison, you see, uh, why not their cases? We quit them after 17 years? I mean, God, I mean, this is, this is criminal. Uh, we need to find where these cases are, this computer systems, the technology must find these cases and say, sir, forget about other cases, these are the cases to be heard first. So I think that is important and we need to build that category, women, children, persons with different abilities, these cases ought to be heard. I mean, there are generations passing. I know students who want to get back to their studies, but the case is not being fixed. They keep requesting informally because the system doesn't read it. The system does not understand the urgency of a case. Artificial intelligence needs to be sensitized to the urgency of a litigant and why a particular case must come up first. And unless we do that, we're not a sensitive system and there's no point in talking about human rights if we do not understand what case and how that case matters to an ordinary litigant. It's that's the level of sensitivity the court has to understand. Only then could we actually reach out to people and dispense justice. Then, so I've already talked about the fact that there has to be AI and I, I request all the techies sitting here to come up with solutions and tell us what is to be done. The other problem that we face is service of notice. You file a case, the notice doesn't get to the other person. If it does, nobody accepts it. I think technology can easily solve that problem through GPS. We need to understand that a notice was served. We need to come up with an e-portal for judiciary. Instead of filing you know, publications and all sorts of newspapers and all, why can't we have a big e-portal where every notice has to be put up, everybody under the law is supposed to know that there's a notice there after the service of the notice has been done. And in case nobody reads that portal, proceedings can take place. So I think this time to, for the judiciary to develop its own e-portal for putting up all these notices, for putting up all this information on the, on the uh, uh, website or on the, on the portal itself. The other thing which is important and I think the bench book has been talked about is the smart online research center. I think there is no way the judiciary could decide these 2.2 million cases without having a strong research base. It has happened, I mean the Supreme Court now has a research center, but that research center has to expand. It has to reach out to a district judge or a civil judge sitting in any any civil court somewhere, he requires any help, technology can get him the answers in a minute. He could have a tablet with him and he can just, you know, send a query and that query, because everybody is connected, internet is there and they can ask the question from a hub which is to be created in the Supreme Court, technology could do that. We could enhance the quality of the judgments being written by a civil judge. He does not have to wait for PLDs and all the other journals which get to these districts four months or five months after the judgments have come out. And also, they can read all the latest judgments that come out from the Supreme Court. So, once again, an intelligent research center with the help of technology, disseminating information as much and getting all the tiers of the judiciary connected. So, they're reading our judgments, they understand what the Supreme Court is saying, they understand what the High Court is saying, and they're deciding the cases which are before them, and they're so up to date with things, which is not rocket science to my mind, but a bit of technology is required. It's something that I've already mentioned earlier. I think every district, every district must now come up with an ADR center where you're giving the option to people to please move on to mediation, please move on to arbitration. Litigation is not the only solution. Pakistan is moving on on a linear path. Everything has to be combative. Everything has to be in the court, adversarial, fighting each other. I think that mindset and the paradigm has to change. We need to have ADR centers installed in every district. A litigant walks in, the option ought to be given, it's called the multi-door courthouse. You tell them to go get sorted as far as mediation is concerned, use arbitration. And if nothing works, if nothing works, then you can kind of come up to the court again. So I think that needs to open. The whole world is trying mediation, the whole world is experiencing arbitration, but we seem to be away from that. One other technological instrument or technology that could be very helpful for us if the techies could come up with 
is recording of evidence in the trial court. I mean, that's one hell of a pain. So why can't there be an app which actually records not only the audio but the video of that person and then also transcribes it in English and gets it typed out immediately. I think that would be wonderful. You keep a record of the witness, his audio maybe or his video and his transcription can come by using an app. He just simply answers and nobody does anything, records him and that gets transcribed. Could be a hugely beneficial thing for the justice sector because Evidence, the way it's recorded, the way it's written, I and mean, a lot, lot, of, lot of it lost in translation also. So I think a wonderful app in this regard would be helpful. And lastly, there was a talk about judgment writing. I think Grammarly and other, other, other um, you know, apps in the world are used. We, we need to make sure that when the judgment is written, we, we can run it through a system which looks after its legalese, which looks after its English maybe or Urdu maybe, and you know, makes it a, a very uh, wholesome document. I think there could be a software which could help judges who probably do not, I mean, to improve their, in case there's an English issue or there's an issue relating to legalese, uh, a, a, a judgment writing app could also be very helpful. So these are some of the ideas whereby I think we could transform the way justice sector needs to move or the courthouse has to change because just by mere automation, things aren't really happening. And I think technology can really make it happen. So let's get on with this work if we can do that. We have a limited period at the Supreme Court and I hope we will be able to do something and bring transformation. So as they say, Carpe Diem, seize the day. Thank you so much. <laughs>